Good evening and welcome to another edition of Circus History Live presented by the Circus Historical Society. And today we have a terrific program for you. Today is our 2021 award show where we will take a look at some of the amazing things that have been happening in the world of circus history over this past year and how those achievements are being recognized both inside and outside of our community. Uh, we're gonna get right to it in just a moment, but I wanted to give you a couple of housekeeping notes here. One is if you uh, could leave your camera off that will uh, help with the bandwidth usage because we usually get uh, some folks and it just kind of slows things down a little bit. Uh, we will be taking questions a little later on in the program. We're gonna be doing that uh, in the chat room. So uh, if you can see where that chat is, uh, that's where it's gonna be starting. So uh, like I said, we're gonna be talking about a lot of things here that are important to those of us who are interested in circus history. And to start it off, I'd like to uh, bring our friend uh, Jennifer Lemire Posey in, who's gonna be telling us about the Circus Historical Society's Thayer Prize, which uh, was awarded just a short time ago. Jennifer? Great, thank you, Chris. And uh, good evening or afternoon or whatever time of day it is, because I think we may even have some international members with us. Uh, this isn't the same as being in person, but it's still always nice to find a way to gather together. So I am here as the chair of the Stuart Thayer Prize Committee, and I wanted to give just a little background because I think we've got a number of new members who are with us this evening. Uh, for the few who may not know the name Stuart Thayer, I, I think that those of us who do recognize him as a foundational scholar in circus history, Stuart Thayer wrote such seminal publications as, as the Annals of the American Circus and Traveling Showmen, and through his diligent scholarship, researching in the days before you could sit in front of a computer and find out anything you wanted, he brought to light really the great impact of the circus in antebellum America. He began to shed light on how circus was already interacting with American culture and how to think about both the business and the arts of the circus world. And the work he did is what pushes the rest of us forward in the work that we wish to do. After Stuart Thayer passed away in 2009, the Circus Historical Society started to collect funds to found a prize in his honor. So in 2012, the Stuart Thayer Prize was inaugurated to recognize the highest quality scholarly contributions that are in the form of a lasting publication. There's a lot of variety of what kind of publications, but it has to be something that's gonna outlive the rest of us, that will be there for people to see. And those all have to be related to the history of the American circus and the allied arts. So as a committee, we receive nominations each year for this, uh, this prize. We look to publications that have come out within the last two years prior to its recognition. And generally in normal times, we all gather together at our conference and we honor the recipient of the prize each year. And I'm gonna take a little sidestep here because we missed last year's as well. So Chris Berry deserves a little bit of a shout out because we didn't get to do any in-person recognition of the fact that Chris was actually honored as the 2019 recipient of the Thayer Prize for his bandwagon article, The Greatest Shows on Earth, which brought all new light to the Feld's contribution of, of growing and changing the greatest show on earth to meet the needs of the later 20th century. So Chris, a quick congratulations to you for really excellent work done. Um, this year, the committee uh, and I had another slate of really wonderful, wonderful articles and contributions to circus history. I want to take a moment, first of all, to recognize the committee that works with me. Uh, Buddy Calhoun nominated me to the committee a couple of years ago, and um, in that time, the committee has included Herb Eckert, Jim Foster, Maurice Polinsky, Bill Schreiber, Kurt Spence, and Kat Vecchio, and it is a group project to both read through all of these wonderful submissions and to talk about what it is that brings one piece above others. This year was particularly challenging because we had excellent candidates. There were five pieces that were nominated for the Thayer Prize for 2021. My years are still mixed up. Um, and I, I, I'm gonna read those out as well because I think that I want to encourage our members to recognize the great scholarship that's happening across the board. So Chris Berry was nominated for several of his bandwagon articles, Emmett Kelly in the Spotlight, A Quiet Hero, Henry Ringling North Behind Enemy Lines, 
and The Show That Roared, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey from 1920 to 1926. Anya Norris was recognized for Lore No More, uncovering Ava Clark's rightful legacy. And then we had what would ultimately come out to be the recipient of the 2021 Thayer Prize, Don Regala's When the Circus Comes to Town, an American Tradition in Photographs. I want to acknowledge all of the work again, and I also would like to take a quick moment to say that Greg Parkinson, as editor of Bandwagon, has done a wonderful job in encouraging this scholarship. But when the circus comes to town stood out uh, among this wonderful pool of candidates for a number of reasons, most specifically because of the unique combination of, of the firsthand experience that Dr. Regala brings from, from her photographs and her words that was combined with a scholarly rigor of additional essays within that volume. So the book is exceptional in every way. The scholarship is on point, is well documented, and is very it adds greatly to our knowledge and understanding of the circus in culture. The book, as I mentioned, is a beautiful publication. It's 288 pages, hardcover book with a selection of photographs that Dawn took in the 1990s over a period of about seven years as she traveled with a variety of tented circuses in the country. And the accompanying essays, one is Dawn's own essay, The Running Away with the Circus, a photographer's story which helps broaden her firsthand experience and give context to the humanity of the circus lot, as well as additional essays, Step Right Up, The History of Work Photography and Circus Photographs in Context by David Haberstitch, and Ladies and Gentlemen, Historical Parallels in Circus and Photography by Shannon Perich. Um, having these additional essays is one of the most important things to help broaden general awareness of the circus and to help people think about the circus in bigger ways. Having the beautiful photographs that bring the humanity of the circus lot is what draws everybody into this volume. And Don, we are so pleased to present you uh, in an abstract way with the 2021 Stuart Thayer Prize. Congratulations. Congratulations indeed. Thank you, Jennifer. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, Dawn before we uh, get into this. So when Dawn published her book last year, When the Cir Circus Comes to Town, she is a conservator and program manager at Smithsonian Museum's Conservation Institute, but she's more smooth than that. She traveled with the photograph, these 11 tented circuses in the 1990s that we're going to be hearing about, including the Clyde Beatty Cole Brothers Circus, Big Apple, Carson and Barnes, Kelly Mill, seven other circuses. And her this work uh, at the National Museum of American History that she has created and subsequently donated to the uh, Circus Photographs and Papers Collection is actually the largest circus collection, single circus collection at the Smithsonian. So thank you for that, for preserving that for future generations also. Uh, it was a long term project, obviously, from the 1990s till now. So Dawn, uh, again, congratulations on behalf of Jennifer, myself, and everyone else on the call. Tell us a little bit about how this book came about and what we could expect if we have not seen it yet. Thank you. I'm, I'm really honored and I'm honored for all of the people who put this book together because as you said, it's not, it's not just me, but also my wonderful colleagues at the Smithsonian. Um, I know that people are really just interested in the photographs and hearing a little bit about it. You don't need to be looking at me. So I'm going to throw some images up there. Hang on just a second. And I think, okay, does everybody see that? Yes, we do. Excellent. Okay, so I'm just going to run through a couple of these, you know, as you mentioned, I started this in the 90s. I mean, I was, I was a kid. I, I didn't know what I was doing. I had a feeling that this was important. I had a feeling that um, it was unusual that I'd be allowed to travel with all these shows, that I get the entire season's route cards so that I could connect with other shows who were near where I was when I was when I was shifting from one show to another but I didn't really understand the full importance of it and I had the, I did this for as you said most of the 1990s and then I had these 10,000 plus slides and negatives back in the days of slides and negatives and I had these for a really long time and wasn't really sure where these were going to go and trying to find the right home for them and I really want to uh, 
you know, give a shout out to the National Museum of American History, to my colleagues. Shannon Parrish is the curator of photography of the Photographic History Collection at uh, NMAH. I'm going to use the acronym because I'm in DC and everything is an acronym. And David Haverstick, who's the photography curator at the Archive Center at NMAH. NMAH sorry. And they really saw the value of this as a historical document, as an archive, and really pushed to have this as, as, as a standalone collection at the museum. And all together, we worked on this book. I want to thank Ginger Minkowitz, who's at Smithsonian Scholarly Press. She's the one who felt this really needed to be in a publication so that more people could see these images and hear these stories. And so we all came together and looked at it from these multiple curatorial angles, right? About art, labor, um, history. These curators really brought this eye to it. And we did work together on picking images, but they really took the lead on picking and sequencing these images. And it was really phenomenal to see what images they picked and how they put them together in ways that I was frankly too close to see. Um, I'm, I'm just thrilled to death that this is resonating with people. I'm really happy. I keep getting emails from people who recognize people that they know. And it's, it's just really great. It, it's, I have a few more slides to go through, but it's I've written down in my little notes so I don't forget things, but that, you know, the planet's really aligned to pull together the art and the scholarship and this history. And in 2017, I believe it was, is when this entered the collection of the Smithsonian, which is also the year the Smithsonian Folklife Festival focused on circus arts and had me on a panel. And that was the time that I learned that a lot of these shows are no longer around. And it really hit home to me how the archive had found exactly the right place where everybody can access it, where this is a part of American history. It, it's exactly where it should be. And I'm just, I'm just thrilled for the belief and generosity of everybody that made this happen and, and really thrilled for the, the award. Thank you. So John, how, yeah. did you, how did you come up with this idea to, kind of go out and first of all, the first circus you went with, but then also to kind of continue uh, over a period of years to document this. I mean, um, were you a circus fan as a kid? No, I had never been to the circus as a kid. Um, I was a graphic designer and I was doing photography on the side. I'm not a trained photographer, I'm not a professional photographer. I didn't understand I was doing humanist documentary photography until after I came off the road and somebody looked at my stuff and said, that's what it was. Um, I was using photo emulsion on metal and glass to make my photos look different than if it was on paper. And uh, so I was using, I was taking, using subject matter that I thought looked a little timeless and would be hard to date in that format. So I was doing landscapes and nudes and stuff. And I was going to a job interview one day and there was a circus in the parking lot nearby on the way to the job interview. And I blew off the job interview and drove up to the circus. And I had heard a rumor a friend of mine had joined. So I used that as a way to say, hey, does so-and-so work here? And it turned out it was the circus he joined, but he'd only made it a week and never made it out of town because it's hard work. And um, that was Big Apple. And they really took me under their wing and were really wonderful. And um, I was out one night with a bunch of the guys and somebody asked me what I was gonna do with all these photos. And I had an out of body experience where I heard myself talking about a book. And I distinctly remember thinking, that sounds like a really good idea. <laughs> While I was saying it, I, you know. Um, and so the show helped me and unbeknownst to me, people from Big Apple were calling their colleagues at other shows and letting them know that I would be contacting them. So that when I called a show and said, can I come visit you at winter quarters? I wanna travel with you, I wanna take pictures. And they, somebody hung up the phone, they turned to the lot boss and said, you know this person? Oh yeah, so-and-so told me about her. So they were really helping in the background and I had, I had no idea. I mean, I really was an, an idiot kid. But this was total immersion for you. I mean, it wasn't just yeah. taking pictures, right? Oh, I, I traveled with and lived with all of the shows, had an RV, hooked up to the electric and the water when there was water. I think there's a picture in the book of me washing my hair in a bucket for some place where there wasn't water or I arrived late and didn't have the water hookup. Um, I, you know, helped pick up trash when it was a muddy lot and everybody had to be helping with the tent. I 
sold concessions one night during the blow off, I think for Sterling and Reed when somebody quit without notice and they were one person short. Um, at Walker Brothers, I think it was Graham Polikoff, I'm not sure if I'm getting his last name right, I'm so sorry, uh, who gave me an opportunity to try being a clown and I learned it. it's really, really hard, much harder than I thought and I, I was trying my hardest and I really didn't do a very good job. I'm so sorry to everyone who had to watch me be a clown. <laughs> I know that some of the people who uh, you actually photographed are on this call because I like Tim Teggy, for example, who has a great uh, uh, acknowledgement in the book and uh, and others who uh, you have come to know and and so forth. Uh, by the way, if you have questions uh, for Don, uh, just go into your chat and uh, feel free to send those. Um, just a couple of couple of more questions. So where were these shows? I mean, did you travel the length and breadth of the United States? Yes. You, for the most part. Of, okay. Yeah. Because Circus Vargas is on there as is Beatty yep. Cole. You know, I mean, that's the East Coast to the West Coast, right? Or Everywhere from Washington State down through California, all the way across in Texas and Arizona, all the way down in Florida and Georgia. If I never see that section of I-95 again, uh, just back and forth <laughs> that section of I-95. Um, and, you know, in every place in between, uh, I can remember friends of mine, a lot of it was driving from one place to the other, of course. I remember, I think it was my mother asking me how was Nebraska, and I said it was six hours, because that's all I did was just go straight through Nebraska. So yeah, everywhere, really everywhere. So as you look back on, so what year did you start and what year did you sort of wrap it up? 92 to 98. Um, most of it was 95, 94, 95, 96 was the bulk of it. But my old ice cream truck looking RV broke down during one planned trip. So I had to go back out. I would go out with two shows about a month with each show. And then I would go back home and do a graphic design project to make enough money to go back out and then blow a tire and call my bosses crying and they wire me money to get the, the RV fixed. <laughs> yeah, it was that it was that kind of thing. Um, I don't know if we've run through all the, do you mind if I just list what circuses they are? Absolutely, please. And, and any uh, specific memories you might have from any of those shows too. And I, and I can do the years. I made a little, little cheat sheet. Uh, so Big Apple, so 92 through 95. I think at one point, uh, Paul Binder said I was like wallpaper. Because I was just there in the background. Uh, Carson and Barnes was 95. Circus Vargas was 98. So that was after I had to rent an RV. Uh, Clyde Mead Cole Brothers was 95. Culpepper and Merriweather uh, was 96. Franzen Brothers twice, uh, 1994, which was a lot they were sharing with Roberts Brothers just for a couple of days. And um, then I went back out with them for a longer period in 96. Kelly Miller was 95. Uh, Roberts Brothers, like I said, was 94. Sterling and Reed was 98. Uh, that's when I went out to Arizona, I had Vargas and then went over to Sterling and Reed. Vidbell, uh, Old Time Circus was 93, and Walker Brothers was 95. So, so when you look back at the photographs that you took, I mean, as you mentioned, uh, kind of at the beginning, you cover everything from the performers to the construction of the big top, from the transportation to how people eat. Uh, what were some of the surprises, I guess, that you had when once you first started on this? And then what were some of the things that were sort of the same, no matter which show you were on? Okay. The surprises, I think, I didn't expect the shows to have slightly different personalities. It, it felt to me like people would work at different shows in, in my impression of it, until they found their home and then would kind of stick with that show. So each show was very much like a family and not to me and not just because they were close knit, but it, yeah, I don't know how to explain it, but each show seemed like sort of a standalone family. Um, everybody was incredibly generous. And, and some of this is me again, looking back on it uh, there always seemed to be somebody at the show who thought I didn't know what I was getting myself into and would kind of let people know not to mess with me. And I didn't hear about that until years later that people had had done that sort of in um, to help me out. Uh, everybody was just wonderful. I interviewed a lot of people and it was really wonderful to hear the stories of how people found their way to the circus. And, and who stayed and, and who didn't stay and what it was, what it meant to them. And um, the same 
an incredible amount of hard work, really hard work, a lot of long stretches of waiting for something to happen, and then a really great, wonderful thing like, you know, great weather in a full house and a really good crowd and suddenly everybody's excited again and jazzed again. And, you know, that was that was really interesting to see how emotional it was um, throughout a season. Fantastic. Well, we have a lot of ground to cover here. Again, uh, Don Regala, the name of the book is When the Circus Came to Town. You can get it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, any of the places where you would normally uh, buy books online. Uh, I think that if you go to the Smithsonian website, there may be something there too, right, Don? Yeah, under Smithsonian Scholarly Press. You can see all the books the Scholarly Press does, so you can help them out with all the rest of the scholarship that comes out of Smithsonian. But it will also have links to the various websites where you can you can buy the book. And I will be there. The plan is for me to be there next time that we're all in person. So I can She's going to be joined. Yep. Uh, you know, God willing, uh, Don will be with us at the CHS convention next year in Bridgeport. So Don, again, congratulations. Uh, over 200 of pages of some of the most amazing photographs you've ever seen. I mean, she took 10,000. So you know that there's some really good ones in there. So uh, thanks again. Congratulations on winning the 2021 Stuart Thayer Prize. Uh, speaking of Bridgeport, uh, we are now going to take you to Bridgeport, uh, where we're going to be uh, joined by Kathleen, uh, Kathleen um, Marr, who is at the Barnum Museum. And she's got some exciting news too, because both uh, the Barnum Museum and Circus World Museum within the past uh, several weeks really have received word that they have received from the National Park Service uh, a Save America's Treasures grant. And I know that this has been a long time coming for you, Kathleen. Uh, you've been working on this since the uh, devastating tornado that you had a few years ago. So tell us a little bit about this grant and tell us about why you need it. So sure, and seeing how we, we're um, in the theme of pictorials, let's go to the show. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, can everybody at least see that? Yes, we can. Yes. I'm just trying to get, clean up the bar here so I can get to my slideshow. Here we go. So, okay. Uh, Okay, go ahead. Yeah. You got it? Yep. Okay, so yes, thank you everybody for coming out on a, on a uh, Sunday evening. And uh, I certainly want to thank Jen for putting this together. Dawn Bravo, what a wonderful publication. Um, we're all excited about it and having everybody come to Bridgeport. And a huge shout out to Scott. Uh, Save America's Treasures grants are not for the faint of heart. And they are construct ours uh, were construction grants, and you need a lot of documentation and drawings and spe uh, specifications and compliances with your national like register uh, guidelines and Section 106 standards. So there's a lot that goes into this, and I am so happy to be in such good company. And you know, cheers for, for our subject matter actually bringing home two of these. They were only um, 24 given in the country. So this is a huge deal. So yes, that's a close up of our building. And just to give you a little context, I think a lot of you know it, this is P.T. Barnum's original museum that opened in 1842 in New York City. And um, the Barnum Museum today pretty much keeps up with the disaster theme uh, that <laughs> occurred. I'm going, to interrupt, um, I'm going to interrupt you for just a second here. I don't think sure. we're getting the full effect here. We're still looking at the uh, the slides and uh, the original. Are you? Yeah. So I think well, you want to maybe go to the um, home page and or the slideshow slideshow button. Yeah, that's what I did. Okay. Actually, oh, I apologize. Let me see if I can get out of this. Let me stop share for a second and let's try this again. So it should have. Now, what is it doing? There we go. That's it? Okay. Yep. Okay. So let's just zip through as quick as our fade can do it for us. Yes. So this is the Barnum Museum. Uh, as it stood uh, right about 1900. It was in the corner of Main Street and Gilbert Street. And it 
actually looks like this today. Um, still prominently poised on Main Street. It certainly is iconic. A lot of people think that it might be a funeral home. I wish I was kidding, but it is still functioning as a museum. And for those of you who don't know and will be coming next year, this is where you will be. Um, we're just about an hour and 15 minute train ride out of New York City, so that's always an option. And we are a precarious stone's throw um, from the Long Island Sound, which means absolutely nothing to Jen and the Gulf of Mexico. So <laughs> both of these institutions sit in very, very risky parts of the country, particularly now as we go through so many um, changes in climate and impacts happen. Now, what really is interesting, and it makes uh, everything that I'm talking about relevant, is this is Main Street. So that is the west facade of the building that sits on Main Street. And along that plaza where the two trees are, that actually used to be a road. So when the tornado hit Bridgeport, this was ground zero. If Gilbert Street still ran um, along the museum, at least the wind would have had a way to pass. Instead, it smacked directly into the building. And this is one of the, it's simple physics. This is one of the main reasons why we have so much damage today. This is actually a picture of the tornado, um, just as it was hitting. This is a, an image from Homeland Security. They don't tell me where the camera is because then they have to kill me, I guess. But that is literally the shot that they got of the EF1 tornado. This was just on the other side of our street massive old trees came down everywhere and it just blew the main windows out of the building and a testament to the extraordinary uh, pioneers of uh, the building of the 19th century. The building looked very strong, still looks very strong. Uh, everybody says, oh, clean up the glass and it's fine. Well, the fact of the matter is, we, as we were trying to assess the building the following year, 2011, we got hit with Hurricane Irene, and then the subsequent year, it was Superstorm Sandy. So it was it was the trifecta of natural storms that hit the building. So we had forensic documentation on top of forensic documentation because every time our historic preservation architects did an assessment of the building, we had to go back in and reassess. Now, meanwhile, we're trying, I'm not talking about the collections in this um, little talk today. That's a whole nother topic. Um, so this is really uh, building focused. But this is what we had to deal with. Um, the miniature circus model that we have uh, was literally on this floor. Um, it had it took about three months to you had to clean everything. Everything needed triage in place. You couldn't take something terribly contaminated and move it to um, a clean environment. So it took three months to really take down the object, um, document everything, and get it out of the way. And then we had to start getting into the building. So this was, I mean, this was, a, this was, and that's just one room. Um, but with the team, because the building is on the National Register of Historic Places, um, right before the tornado hit, we did a whole entire process to become nationally significant. There's a hierarchy and forgive me, this is kind of the weeds, um, but you can be either locally significant state or nationally significant. The only way we could apply for a Save America's Treasures grant is to be nationally significant. So back in 2004, I started the process of getting the building elevated to national significance. We got there in May of 2010. In June of 2010, we got hit with the tornado. The building lost the structural integrity and the national parks took us off the process because the building wasn't healthy enough to actually become a national historic landmark, which Scott already is, or Scott's buildings already are. But even though that was taken away from us, we still had to fix the building. And this is the day that we brought in six tons of steel I-beams uh, into the building. And if you could look at this, you could see those tires holding up, those are aluminum columns holding up the south rim of the dome. Beyond that, there are two gray columns that we brought in that were actually in the drawings to repair the building in the 1980s and were never installed. And then beyond that, that entire wall with the arch windows was covered over with 1980 drywall. So we didn't realize how damaged the building was. And if you could see there's just those gray column, like uh, what that actually is, it's, it's root, it's root canal. 
we had to put strong backs into the building because the east wall almost collapsed. And this was the top ridge line that we say. Now, the good part of it is that we raise money and this is what the ridge line looks like today. So we did that. And of course, the next urgency, because we were doing the work as the money came in and what were the priorities. Uh, the next priority is, was actually the dome. The tornado lifted the dome and shifted it. And you can't put it back. That's not, th that, that makes things worse. But we had to figure out how to redistrib uh, redistribute the weight load capacity of the dome to, uh, to, to really handle its ongoing, um, its ongoing position and integrity in the building. So this is what we had to deal with. In the 1980s, they made it look like, a, like an Elon Musk tower to launch things to outer space. It was all the wrong kind of insulation. It all had to come out. Uh, so we had to start pulling it. What we found was they created a terrarium by putting this in and we had mold growth. So we had to let it sit for a while until we could actually get it done. So this is what the third floor looked like as we were pulling all of that material out. So it's just been ongoing. But today, this is actually looking up. So all of that light wood and those rods are literally um, just resistered uh, ribs. Ribs had to be rejointed together and uh, a whole entire mechanism uh, to really manage the weight load distribution points all had to be re-engineered. So we did that. Got a phone call uh, from, at that point, got a phone call from the National Park Service saying, hey, we just got off the phone with the Connecticut State Historic Preservation Office. You've done such great work. Let's try to make you a National Historic Landmark. So it was like, what? So we did enough work um, to get us back in the queue to be an NHL. Um, but a lot of people say, like, how have you been doing it? So since the tornado, and, and I tell people this all the time, it was five years of fighting the insurance companies. Um, we managed, the Barnum Museum Foundation managed ours very well. The lawyer uh, for the city who managed the building did not do such a good job, but we did get some of that money. But these are all the places that we actually went to to try to get money. Again, this this budget that you're looking at doesn't factor in this 11 2 million doesn't factor in all the money that we had to raise for programming for operations for the collections for exhibitions that is strictly for the building so where we are today is um, we got a bonding appropriation uh, just under seven million dollar bonding appropriation from the state of Connecticut to really deal with the health of the building and we were able to leverage the state money to actually get the Save America's Treasures money, the 500,000 Save America's Treasures. And people often say, well, what have you been doing for the last five years? There's nothing more like exhausting than trying to explain how much time it takes to do something like this. And, and I've told this, Bruce and I have had this conversation over and over again. Any institution that's going through a major renovation okay, is doing it behind closed doors. They're functioning, the public is blind to it. And I am not kidding if I say to you, it can take 15 years or more to raise the money, to get everything prepared, to have the artifacts all ready to outload and then get in there and do the work another couple of years, two, three, maybe even four years. It's almost two decades of time and energy. So when people ask us, why is it taking so long? It's like, we're actually ahead of schedule. So, it's, and we've been doing it. And the hardest part of all this is managing the public perception of it all. But this is all the work that we've been doing year after year after year to really get us to this point today and have these documents. This is a lot of words, you don't have to read it. But um, as I was saying, these, these grants are certainly not for the vein of heart. You really have to have a plan and a very specific plan. And we had all the drawings, all the documents ready to go. We were able to carve the windows. The, the plan was like, what is what can we focus on that will make sense? And because the Connecticut Chippo and I don't know if you, SHPO is State Historic Preservation Office. Every state has to have one. And every single National Register property is under the auspices of a SHPO. It's the same thing in Wisconsin. Actually, it's the same thing in Florida too with, with Karasan. 
Um, but we were able to carve out the windows of our overall project because it made sense. There, believe it or not, the windows are always the most complicated, complicated thing because you have to balance modern thermal dynamics within the historic preservation guidelines. Um, and even the, the Save America's Treasures person said that it was one of the first things she said to me was like, we love Windows projects. And I'm like, what? But, but there it was. it was, it was a good choice to actually go down that path. Shippo wants mostly everything restored. Um, so you can't just go in and slam aluminum windows in it and be done with it. Every single window had to be inventoried. And interestingly with COVID, and I'm sure uh, the Ringling Project has this too, the cost escalations have pushed our project uh, about a million six over. Um, things are settling down now, but they're not gonna go back to the original uh, $7 million budget that we created. So we had to be creative and find ways to offset the balance. So this is one page of our drawings, but I thought you'd like to see just the complexity of everything that we were looking at in the engineering. And we have to, you have to work with a historic preservation architect, period. And if that architect is not perceived or deemed by the SHPO, the state SHPO, they can't proceed with the project. Um, and, and, and you have to comply because you need to get historic preservation easements, restrictions on the building. We have so many preservation restrictions on the Barnum building now. My death count is I will be 115 years old at this point um, when the easements go away on the Barnum building. But we had to get up there and we really had to look at the windows and assess each one, each one in full detail. So for us, it's not a couple of ladders. We had to get lifts um, and cranes. We're going to have to get scaffolding. And you can see that every window in the building is different. <laughs> so there's, and this doesn't include the stained glass windows. You'll see that a little later. But we had to get up there and do close shots. Now, um, I don't want to go on too much, but what our preservation architect actually did within the scope of all of the drawings was inventory every single window, classify them within, the, so there's 21 different types. And then what she also did window by window is create a schedule of their condition, how many of each particular window, and then they're all coded within the drawings themselves. So this is just some of the pieces um, that you can see. Now, as far as the pictures of the windows, I left this picture in because in the Save America's Treasures applications, they can, our federal government can not take resolution higher than this. And I just wanted to point that out. And Dawn is probably laughing. So every single picture that we had, we had to like suck all the clarity out. Um, and this is what they see. But these are the actual pages of, uh, from the grant that we submitted. And you can see that this, um, this elevation right here, these are the second floor windows, um, that they're generally poor. And I took a few close-up shots as well, that you can see how deteriorated uh, the wood is. Now the wood, this is on uh, the exterior. A lot of this damage actually follows through to the interior as well, which really causes thermal issues. Uh, to make the whole thing even more complicated is the curve around the uh, corner of the building. The windows are curved. So again, that just adds another major expense because now we're gonna deal with curved glass, curved wood. Uh, so you really need specialists. And I actually almost think that this shot is a work of art, but you can see how damaged and how deteriorated. Now that does not deter Shippo. Um, what they want us to do is restore everything as much as possible with epox uh, as, as much as possible with epoxy injections. Now, with the dome as well, when you're looking down from on, on a bucket truck from the dome, it doesn't look as bad from from the ground. But when you get up close uh, and you start looking at these things that we're dealing, every single window has its own complicated level of um, of restoration that's required and it all has to be documented and again this is a 14 foot high uh window system at the third floor there is nothing on the inside of it this is the stairwell this is the uh south um the southwest tower uh but again every single every single window has to be really assessed highly specifically 
and determined. Now, this was this was one of the reasons why we decided to do Save America's Treasures is um, Shippo gave us pushback. What our historic preservation architect originally did was suggest more repair, more wood replacement to stabilize the windows. And Shippo was like, mm, no. And we were like, we can stick a screwdriver <laughs> through the wood. And they were like, yeah, but you know, there might be technology in 50 years and then we've lost it and, and there's no way back. So we really want you to do it this way. And the answer is yes. And the answer is yes. Um, did that set us off our original budget? Um, it was going to, we've put this project through cost estimators, uh, historic preservation cost estimators a few times. But what we found out was Save America's Treasures is where we land with the windows. Um, and then you can see, and I'm wrapping up too, I don't wanna take up too much, um, too much more time, but this is the inside of the third floor. So you can see really what we're dealing with now. It's been cleaned up as much as possible, but the deterioration is coming through to the inside. And um, a lot of that is happening to the, from the moisture through the stone system on the exterior. So as we are moving forward with the windows to assure you, the full state bonding package, the um, $6.91 million is dealing with the entire exterior restoration. So the repointing uh, terracotta tiles are going to be replaced or repaired when necessary. That all of that is gonna get taken place. There's gonna be some minor mechanical happening inside because we have to deal with electrical as well as uh, HVAC systems, uh, what that weight loss capacity. So we've got our full team assembled. We've got the historic preservation, uh, structural engineers, MEP people, um, and <laughs> believe me, we have our budget people as all of this begins uh, and starts moving forward. Now, as far as the stained glass is concerned, they are in the full uh, $7 million package, uh, the state bonding budget, but the stained glass will not be a part of, it's above, and beyond the Save America's Treasures. So they will be restored as well, but not part of the SAT. And um, yeah, we're getting there. <laughs> you know, we're coming. This is the, uh, yeah, this is one of the small tower windows who's been boarded up since the tornado because there's no way to really get up there without some kind of lift behind the building. So, and as uh, we were saying Wednesday, and thank you, Bruce, for being on the call um, after all of those years and being paused from becoming a National Historic Landmark, going back to the table, submitting our package, and then having a global pandemic, pause it again. And then the last presidential administration completely disbanded the program for almost four years. It was reinstated um, just this year and we were the second meeting and on Wednesday, the National Landmark Advisory Committee voted unanimously for the Barnum Museum to be a National Historic Landmark. Just fantastic, just absolutely fantastic, uh, Kathleen. And you know, uh, we have watched you over the past decade plus uh, deal with this issue and it's so wonderful to see uh, your advocacy for saving. And you haven't even gotten into the stuff that's inside in the way of the artifacts. Mm -hmm. We all know that uh, it's expensive <laughs> to do work around the house, but you know, consider your house being over 100 years old and uh, with technology that's totally, uh, totally different really congratulations to you. Thank you uh, on behalf of everyone who has an interest not only in circus history, but in the history of the United States of America, because uh, your hard work is paying off. And uh, I think that a lot of us look forward to seeing you next year at the Circus Historical Society Convention, which will be in Bridgeport. And we will definitely come and uh, toast you uh, then. Yes, you can see it all firsthand, and then you can all take me out for a drink. So <laughs> everybody stay well. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Kathleen. So, uh, you know, we're going to take you now from uh, Bridgeport, you know, the home of P.T. Barnum to Baraboo, Wisconsin, the home of the Ringling Brothers, where uh, our good buddy Scott O'Donnell has uh, great news to share, too. And if you've been down there on Water Street, you've seen all of the great uh, buildings that they have. But there was always one. There's always one building that just kind of stuck out like a sore thumb. And what's what's going to be happening there, Scott? 
Well, thanks, Chris. It's a pleasure to join everybody here on the uh, Hollywood Squares of Zoom land uh, and to celebrate all of this fantastic momentum for, for all things circus. I feel like at Mount Vernon and establishments like that, they're going, what's going on with circus this year? Uh, and that's pretty awesome. Uh, so excited. So, Chris, you are exactly right for those of you that have visited Water Street and all of our National Historic Landmark buildings. We we refer to it as the office. Some people call it the White House, and that always causes confusions when we say the White House for people out of town. They're like, wait, you have a White House? Uh, but it has sort of been this nondescript building uh, that actually has a profound uh, heritage uh, in, in the circus uh, empire of the Ringling Brothers. Uh, it's built in 1901. And let me see if I can do my screen share. Stay with me, everybody. Here we go. See if I am successful doing this. Share. Gosh, we're, we're good. Uh, so 1901, uh, the, the office building uh, is in its current location. Uh, we, fe we feel uh, that it might have moved or a portion of it might have moved. I guess I should step back for a second and let you all know that we are currently in the process of an HSR, Historic Structures Report, for all of the Ringlingville buildings. It's a long overdue, uh, important seminal document uh, that will help guide the restoration uh, of uh, the buildings, the Ringlingville buildings, and also help shape uh, future uh, master planning for Ringlingville, because that is the plan to reactivate Ringleyville in a way that it has not been uh, in the past. Three years ago, when we officially became part of the Wisconsin Historical Society, we applied for a Save America's Treasures grant for this building, because when we get to the photograph section, you'll understand why. Uh, it's the building and the structure that has the most imminent need for restoration. Uh, it's in the most dire of con conditions, particularly in the interior of the building. Uh, so we applied for the State of America's Treasures Grant and we were denied uh, the last cycle. One of the reasons, uh, primary reasons was that there was no historic structures report, uh, not only for this building, but for the Ringlingville buildings. So thanks to the wonderful generosity of some uh, private funders, we were able to uh, get that in motion. And Isthmus Architects uh, out of Middleton, Wisconsin are currently in the process of doing that. They have knowledge of uh, the Ringling heritage in the Baraboo area. They have worked with Circus World in the past for the first two phases of the restoration of the Ringling train shed. They also were the architect and uh, the architectural firm that did the HSR for the Al Ringling Theater uh, prior to its recent full restoration. Uh, so they're familiar with uh, the Ringling heritage in our community. Uh, so way we went with uh, the HSR with uh, Isthmus Architect. Those off so I can see better. So Ringling fell. For those of you who can't imagine anybody here has not possibly been on Water Street, but if not, when we talk about Ringlingville, what do we mean? Well, it's the original Winter Quarter buildings, uh, National Historic Landmark buildings down Water Street. Uh, here's an aerial view of them with number one being the Camel House, number two being the Ring Barn, number three, the Elephant House, four and five, two animal houses, number six is that tiny little white office structure, and number seven being the baggage horse barn course, it is uh, of the smallest square footage of all of the buildings. And there's been uh, some chatter here in the local community going $500,000 for this house. How, how, how are those funds? Uh, that's going to make it like the most expensive house uh, in Baraboo. Uh, well, as you just uh, saw and heard from Kathy, it's a pretty exhaustive process uh, to go through with these full restorations. Uh, and we're gonna accomplish a lot for this structure. So what do we know about the structure? Of course, Ringling Office was constructed about 1901. So I started to say previously during this HSR, uh, the historian of note uh, with the project is starting to zero in on and believes that it might've been two structures that were actually moved and joined together uh, in its current location to become uh, the office structure uh, in 1901. It's a Queen Anne style residence with two stories, a full basement, and a 12 by 20 brick vault. If you visited 
uh, any time uh, in Circus World's existence. It's looked like a garage, uh, but it was actually uh, their vault and it was right next door. The porch that's on the front was added by the Ringling someplace between 1904 and 1913. Uh, we can tell that by the sort of forensic deep dive on historic photographs and, and, and documents that we can review. We know that all the brothers uh, had offices in this building. Brothers Otto and Al had offices on the first floor, Charles, LT, and Gus on the second floor, along with the consultation room. How in the world do we know that? Uh, well, uh, one of the big conundrums with this building is, is the lack of any yet to be uh, found internal photographs uh, of this building when it was used as an office. But we do have a 1905 billboard article uh, that described uh, the author's visit to the Ringling Winter Quarters and to this building and helps us to know these details that we cannot put together uh, photographically. Similarly, by uh, that article and by uh, Sandbor Math, we know it was heated by steam and had electric lights. It's a mortared field stone foundation. Sandborn maps, as I, as I just mentioned, are, are a great forensic tool as we do deep dives during the, uh, this process. This is from 1913, showing Water Street. And of course, uh, here is the office structure uh, along Water Street. It's 1903 or 1913 to 1915. We have this wonderful photograph uh, by a photographer by the name of Heck. And you can see uh, the office structure uh, located right in between uh, that animal house and the ring barn, or the ring barn, the baggage horse barn, excuse me. And then if we do this, which is Water Street today, you get to see the outside of it being a paved road. and and modern electrical poles and a fire hydrant instead of that uh, octagonal building that was out in front of the office, which held a fire uh, fighting equipment. Uh, there's the office uh, structure. So part of the forensic deep dive on this is figuring out what's missing uh, from the structure. So we look at the picture prior to this, we notice that there's chimneys and, and, and ventilation uh, for uh, the heating. We notice that the windows are different uh, in the pane construction or pane construction uh, and, and the alignment of them. We know that dormers uh, were added by the rings to the structures. It, it did not have those lovely dormers over the windows when it first started. And we can also see that electricity now uh, flows into the building a little differently than it did in the historic photographs where from the pole that was outside of it, there would be lines that kind of went to the front of the building and cleated into the electric system uh, for that building. So the condition on the inside, uh, so the, the Ringling office uh, was used uh, until the Ringlings uh, left Baraboo, 1918, went off the lovely bridge port, everything gets tied together. Uh, it was then used for many years by the caretaker uh, of the Ringlingville property. Then it was sold uh, a couple of times actually and became a private residence or a rented residence for 40 plus years. There were uh, residential elements that were added to it such as a kitchen, um, likely some other bathroom elements uh, that were inside, but you can see on the inside, uh, the condition uh, is pretty uh, dire and was easy to photograph uh, and tell that story to the National Park Service for the review of this. There was some, there has been a round of mitigation efforts that was done in 2010 uh, that the Wisconsin Historical uh, Society and the state of Wisconsin put a new roof on to stop uh, water, um, basically a water abate, abatement into the structure to stop uh, any further mold and to stop any further water-based deterioration. There was some structural work done uh, on the inside, any of the newer looking wood, such as uh, the support beams that you see here. This is on the second floor, uh, all the way over to the right uh, side. Also down, uh, downstairs, uh, support beams put in the walls to help uh, the structure remain standing, particularly around the windows. There's a lot of rot uh, around the windows. Uh, 
window sills and the, the, the framing of the windows and in, into uh, the structure itself. A lot of plaster and lat, of course, uh, has come down over the years. There was a porch that was on the back of it that was also removed uh, for some foundational foundation mitigation in 2010. Uh, foundation as well, as you can see, uh, beams put in down in the basement again to help shore up uh, the structure from the ground up. This Save America's Treasures grant we got was $499,999. Not sure where that other dollar went, but we got right up to the threshold uh, of the grant. Uh, the entire project budget is $1.5 million. Uh, that's because it will be from the ground up. It, it is the found foundational work, it's roof work, it's restoration work of all the interior and exterior elements of uh, the structure to make it as future proof as possible. So it's HVAC and it's uh, electric uh, work that will be done. Uh, on the inside of the building. Of course, removing all the materials that contain rot, but retaining as much of the original structure as we can during that process. Repair and, re, repair and restore exterior and interior elements. Uh, some of it uh, during the forensic nature of the period that's going on now, uh, some of it will be informed and some of it will be a historic uh, informed guess uh, is, is my guess uh, once we get through um, the HSR and see what the documents are as far as what the actual layout of those offices were uh, on the inside of the structure. But that is the goal is to return the structure uh, to its original configuration uh, from 1915. That is the year of note. Uh, that our historic structures report and all of the future restoration uh, will be targeted towards 1915 because by 1915, all of the remaining National Historic Landmark buildings that are there, the Camel House being the last, were uh, all up and functional on Water Street. When it's all said and done and uh, we get into 2024 because that's as long as this project is supposed to uh, go on for, uh, we hope for the first time, not we hope, we will for the first time in Circus World's existence be able to welcome in into this uh, structure, which has an amazing history. When we think about the amount of dollars that flowed through this simple structure at probably a nickel and a dime in mission at a time. When we think about all the family meetings and all the operational logistics, of dreaming, conceiving, and exporting to the world, uh, the Ringling Brothers Circus all comes from this house um, or office structure, I should call it. We still call it sort of the house uh, internally, but the office uh, structure. Uh, so we look forward to that. Because of its size, uh, it will be challenging to make it available to the general guest experience. We will have to manage the amount of people that are into the structure. So we, we look for it to be uh, utilized for K-12 programming to make an immersive experience uh, for students to come and learn about the business side of show business and the operational side of the circus industry. And it will also be available for VIP sort of behind the scenes tour sign up uh, experience to get inside the office. Also, because of its size and configuration, ADA accessibility will be challenging, again, for it to be open to sort of the full freight guest experience. But it's something that we're definitely will be looking at uh, as we move forward with its full restoration. Uh, it was a great year for Circus World. We not only got the Save America's Treasures grant, but we also were blessed to get a Shuttered Venues grant uh, as well from the Small Business Administration for $553,000 as well. Uh, so it was, uh, it was exciting, uh, exciting, unique and interesting summer on Water Street. Of course, resuming uh, operations. Nobody has the post pandemic. I, I can't even call it post because we're still in the midst of it. Nobody has the pandemic playbook, uh, at least in this generation. Uh, being a state facility, uh, the protocols and procedures change very nimbly, uh, but still, uh, and with only 40% of our normal operating budget, 
uh, because the year before, of course, us, not unlike most, uh, every business and organization, our year-to-year -year, uh, visitation and earned revenue was off about 97%. Uh, so the shuttered venues grant is very helpful uh, to uh, address those reserves that had to be used to keep Circus World and its collections uh, active, vibrant, and safe during uh, 2020, sort of the first major pandemic year. We're blessed this summer with our visitation uh, at Circus World. Uh, we didn't know who would show up, uh, who would feel comfortable uh, doing it. We had an attendance goal of 17,000 people. Uh, we ended up uh, welcoming over 40,000 people on the Circus World. Our year-over-year -year earned revenue and attendance from 2019 for the same months and days that we were open, uh, we beat every single year. So uh, that was uh, a great experience to watch joy return to our grounds. Uh, so we are so excited to be part, uh, embarking on this project. Again, it, it, so much going on. The Historic Structures Report, uh, which will inform not only the restoration of uh, the 1901 office, but also the beginning of the full restoration of Ringlingville. That will help inform our master planning, which we're about to embark on uh, at Circus World, which hopefully uh, will start a new exciting chapter for Circus World. I mean, some of the things that we're talking about, of course, is a renovated and rejuvenated and total reprogrammatic look at historic Ringlingville. I mean, it's why we're there. Uh, it's one of the main reasons that Circus World might not be in Delavan, Wisconsin, rather than its current location uh, in Baraboo. So attention has to be paid uh, to historic Ringlingville. We're also talking about a year-round performance building and moving to a year-round performance model. Uh, that's exciting as well. Resuming youth circus arts programming and, and teaching the circus arts at Circus World. Uh, so we're excited. Uh, about that as well, and lots, uh, lots of re-envisioning for the for the lib uh, Parkinson Library and Research Center as well. It's uh, it's kind of bursting at its seams, and it, it it's a long overdue for uh, an expansion of uh, that world class facility. So. Uh, we thank everybody that's uh, participated and, and has uh, sent your support. Thanks to Maureen, who sent a lot of great photographs. Again, we're, we're beating the bushes during this forensic time. If anybody has any photographs uh, of the exterior uh, of this uh, uh, iconic building, particularly of the rear, it, it's amazing. We have a lot of photographs, but there's always a strategic wagon or two or a pile of hay uh, or a herd of ostriches. There's always something right in the, in, in the field of view in the, in the background. And of course the Holy Grail would be uh, interior photographs um, of this uh, important office structure during the time uh, of the Ringling operations. We're starting to accumulate lots of interior photographs from the families that lived in this house post uh, Ringling operations, and, and that's helpful as well, just to, to look at fixtures, uh, the original, original fixtures that might still be there, replacements of where they were uh, prior to when they were changed for folks living in that structure. Let me stop my share so we can get the big Hollywood squares back here. Scott, this is uh, exciting, as is Kathleen. Uh, congratulations to you two for this so the significant uh, move for Ringlingville, for uh, Circus World. Uh, I know we all look forward to seeing this uh, operation once it's up and running. So uh, for Kathleen, for Scott, and uh, for Don, you know, congratulations on your awards this year. But before we close out, I know we have Jennifer uh, Posey is still on the line with us. And uh, if you're going out to Florida, you've got a big project you're working on also down there, right, uh, Jennifer? I, I do, but I, I want to pause and again congratulate Scott and Kathy and your your whole staff because the work of doing a grant on that level is huge and and the importance of preserving structures to care for collections cannot be underestimated. So I I'm so proud of you both. I'm so excited to see what will come of it. Congratulations. Absolutely. Um, I, and I just had to say that because listening to those projects is is just inspiring. Um, I, I am keeping busy down in Sarasota. I am not working on a historic structure right now, which is a little bit of a relief. I'm 
going to admit. Um, I am actually working on uh, a new installation project in the Tibbles Learning Center. So those of you who have visited our museum know that the Tibbles Learning Center opened 15 years ago. Uh, and of course, the Howard Brothers Circus model is the heart of that exhibit on the first floor. And on the second floor, we have a timeline of the history of the circus in America, which ends in 1969. Hmm. Um, so we, we, at the time, 15 years ago, it was hard to have certain perspective on the impact of what had happened in the circus world over that time period between, but obviously some kind of monumental moments have happened in the last few years. And so to that end, we are updating the galleries and I'm gonna share the screen quickly to just give you a little bit of a, a teaser of what is to come. We are updating the uh, timeline galleries in the, in the Tibbles Learning Center with the Greatest Show on Earth Gallery. And we'll be looking at the essentially 50 years of Feld stewardship of Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey, and you know whatever is to come, because we all certainly know that there are things on the move. Um, this has been a project that we've been working with Feld Entertainment on, and the gallery is broken into a number of, of spaces. I'm gonna give you an overview, so I totally tease this because I also know we, we are close on time. It's a little tiny space, 3000 square feet, but we are gonna chalk it full of experiences for our visitors to tell a little bit of the history of the Felds coming in, of the changes that they implemented, the, the really important moments like Urban Feld introducing a second touring unit, Clown College, which uh, you know transformed performance and, and brought the art of clowning into the 20th century and then beyond. Um, and that will all play out just in that space that's labeled one. And then in, in two, we're looking behind the scenes at, at all of the different talents that go into creating a, a live performance. So not only the stars in the rings, but also some of the production documents that it takes to get a wonderful space created uh, to, to showcase those talents. In the zone that's marked three, we're creating a little bit of a show, an, an experience that our guests will have a chance to be immersed into the visuals of a circus performance. And it's, it's a large screen, it's about 14 feet in height. So you'll really feel like you're there in the space. Behind the screen are mannequins that will be wearing costumes and they'll be revealed at moments during the show. And then um, because the, the shape of the building is such that we actually are working around the Howard Brothers circus model, which is on the first floor. So the big white cutout there is, is part of the Howard Brothers Circus. So we have a small hallway in the back where our visitors will leave this experience, kind of walking past the memories of the circus, seeing some of the souvenirs and the wonderful things that people take away with them. So this again has been a, a, a working project with Feld Entertainment. They've been tremendously supportive and are helping us um, by loaning some materials and by helping us access some of their media assets to make this come to life. It is, it is truly a celebration. I was struck when Scott mentioned joy. Um, I think that all of us who are doing circus history, especially in this year, know that the one really special thing we get to do is inspire a feeling of happiness, nostalgia for the great things and the wonderful moments that are shared. And that's very much what we hope the Greatest Show on Earth Gallery will do for our visitors. Looking at 50 years, multiple generations should be able to share their moments and their favorite acts of the Greatest Show on Earth. So uh, that is planned to open in February of 2022, although this whole word supply chain has become the bane of my existence. So um, don't hold me to that just yet, but keep your fingers crossed for us. Terrific. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. Again, I want to thank uh, not only our participants today, uh, Dawn and Scott and Kathleen and Jennifer, but also each of you for joining us. The Circus Historical Society does the Circus History Live uh, programs every month, and then we put them up on circushistory.org. We have a lot of people, probably the ma vast majority of those who are on the call tonight are members of the Circus Historical Society, but if you're not, I urge you to consider going to circushistory.org, joining the CHS. Uh, you'll be getting our quarterly uh, magazine bandwagon, which is really a journal of uh, American of world circus history, uh, and uh, just just an opportunity for all of us to share this kind of uh, information and the passion that we all hold for circus history. So again, Jennifer, Kathleen, Scott. 
thank you. Uh, of course, uh, Bruce Hawley is one of uh, those who is always responsible for putting these uh, events together. And today uh, we've had Aileen Barney uh, working some of the controls behind the scenes. So once again, uh, thank you for joining us for another edition of Circus History Live, and we'll see you next time.